Thank you. It's amazing to see so many people coming in for this talk so late in the day already. Um, yeah, uh, let's get started because there's a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little project I've been involved in for the last couple of years called Worldcoin. And what we do is maximally private digital identity. Uh, let's start with the history of the project. It's been around for surprisingly long. It started in 2019 with kind of the observation that a lot of the crypto doesn't work because of the incredibly unequal distribution of tokens. And maybe we can address that by creating a token and airdropping it on every single human on Earth. And also with the observation that um, the concept of humanness is going to be increasingly difficult as AI develops in the digital domain, it's distinguishing between humans and bots is going to be near impossible. We also get a lot of jobs and economic disruption as automation becomes more and more powerful. And we generally need better solutions on a much faster time scale than gover uh, governments can provide us. Um, so this is kind of the founding thesis of, of the project, the observation that, hey, we need something to capture the concept of humanness in the economic realm in a fair and equitable and global way and basically deliver on this original promise of, of what um, blockchain and DeFi was supposed to give us. So, um, an inclusive financial system for every human. And this is where we get to the problem. Every human. With the start of Bitcoin, we have solved a number of open problems and tied them together, and we now know how we can do consensus, how we can do computations and double spend protection and a lot of important primitives that we didn't know how to do before. Um, this opens so many doors, like now that you can write smart contracts and execute them, you can build things that you weren't able um, to build before. But one, one fundamental primitive is still missing, the concept of a human being. There is no such thing in a smart contract yet. And this prevents a lot of very useful stuff from being built. Um, stuff like universal basic income, stuff like lending reputation systems, quadratic voting, you name it. All stuff that has a meaningful impact. This is all things we can unlock if we solve the proof of personhood problem. The idea is simple. You want some way in a smart contract to verify if an action was made by a human being. There's many nuances here. Um, various quality metrics, like uh, we will talk about false accept rates, um, which is like, can someone actually claim two accounts in your system? False reject rates. Does the system maybe reject people um, that are definitely human? Uh, availability, like can anyone on earth that is human sign up for this? Or, do they need to have access to things that might not be available to them? Is the system biased? Like, does the false accept rate or false reject rate specifically target certain groups of people? Um, and then for DAP developers, a very important metric is the target audience saturation. Like, let's say I'm building a DApp and I want to have some form of civil protection in there. Now, if I look at the proof of personhood solutions that I could use, and then I look at the users that might be interested in my D app, I want a large overlap in these uh, sets, otherwise I'm not going to use the system because that means that like my 10 friends that want to try out this app cannot do it because they're not in this particular proof of person system. So all of these are um, important metrics. Um, and then you can even go deeper, like what does proof of person not really mean um, in terms of quality? Like, it's not going to be perfect. No system is ever perfect, especially when you talk about humans on a billion people scale. Um, so what kind of crypto economic guarantees do you want out of a system like this? You could look at, for example, what is the total fraction of Sybil accounts? Like, what's the upper limit there? Is it like one in 10,000 users that might be a Sybil account, one in a million? Um, this is a good metric if you're building an airdrop and you want to make sure that the token economics are fair and you want to make sure that not more than X percentage of your tokens get allocated to malicious actors. If you're building a voting system, this might not even be good enough uh, because if you have, let's say, a 
one in a million uh, civil actor, and you have uh, a billion users in the system, and you're building a voting system for a community of, let's say, 2,000 people, now you know that there are 1,000 civils out there. If all these 1,000 civils belong to the same person, this same person can join your community and just swamp your votes because they control so many civils. So there you get into a metric that is more like, what is the maximum number of civils that a single user can control? Other metrics you could look at is like, what is the cost of attack? Like you might have a mechanism design where things are secure as long as civils cost more than X to create. Whole design space here, still mostly open to explore. Um, another interesting observation is that proof of personhood and CAPTCHAs are closely related, but they're not exactly the same thing. In uh, a proof of personhood system like WorldCoin, you could still automate your account. You can have your wallet exported to its server or whatever, um, run a script against it, and sign stuff using your proof of personhood. You can basically delegate it to your computer and let your computer do things on your behalf um, to the extent that protocols permit such things. In the case of a CAPTCHA, this is not possible because a CAPTCHA is designed to have the human in the loop. It's a proof that a human is in the loop. Um, this also matters for certain, this distinction also matters for like certain applications. So proof of personhood can mean a lot of things in, it depends kind of on your context, what you need here. Now what are the different mechanisms here? Um, when WorldCoin started, it looked at how do we solve the problem at hand, which is do this fair uh, airdrop and look at all the different mechanisms that are there. One you could do is like, oh, you need to sign up with your Facebook account, Twitter account, whatever. Like, use existing online accounts. Um, this doesn't work because it doesn't provide good fraud protection. We all have seen how many bots there are on Twitter right now, and it's getting worse and worse. It also isn't particularly person-bound because you can transfer accounts. Accounts get sold all the time. Um, it's also not private if you don't build um, sophisticated mechanisms around preserving that. So a second popular mechanism that is mostly used in central finance is to rely on central entities, gold governments, to give everyone documents and then verify these documents. Um, issue here is that a lot of people don't have passports or good identity documents. It's also extremely centralized and has all the risks associated with that. So that one was out of the question. Then web of trust. Um, PGP is amazing. Uh, and it works within communities, but it's very hard to scale up because it requires social networks to verify each other. It is a very active, involved process for, and an ongoing involvement from the users. Um, it's also not very fraud resistant because if you have two let's say disconnected communities. One may be part of the web of trust already, but for the second one to enter, they first need to find a whole link to the other group of people. So it's very hard to scale these outwards. And once you have kind of isolated communities, it's also very easy for one crop one to, come, to get in there. So the fraud resistance is not good enough. Um, social graph analysis is essentially the, uh, the same thing, but leveraging existing graphs. So then we get into the like, last category, which is biometrics. Um, these essentially check all the boxes that we're looking for. They, they are private. You can use biometrics without learning anything else about the person. We can make them, as we'll see, very fraud resistant. We can make them very inclusive and uh, decentralized is, in theory, at least possible. And they're the most person-bound thing you can have. Um, defining person as a live human body, that is pretty much what a biometric is looking for. Now, there's a number of important misconceptions about biometrics that we need to go to. They are presumed, uh, they should not be presumed secret. Like your fingerprints, you leave them on every object. There's fingerprints on this orb right now, actually. Um, so whoever fingerprints they are, they are no longer secret. Um, some are more secret than others. Irises are actually surprisingly secret because you really cannot see them from a distance and you need pretty sophisticated optics to get them. Phases are completely not secret. They're all over the place and people make massive data sets out of that. Um, 
But they're not secret, so they're also not private keys. A lot of people think that we're using irises as private keys. No, that will be a very bad idea, for the same reason that you don't want to use fingerprints as, by, uh, as private keys. Um, and the conclusion is that it's not the biometric data, it's not the actual information, it's not the shape of the fingerprint that authenticates you. What authenticates you is that only you have this particular fingerprint on, your, on like a real life finger attached to a human body. This means um, a liveness check. Like, the critical bit about a biometric is not so much the information, um, but it is the fact that you check that it's from a real life human body. And that liveness check requires all sorts of sensors and, and things that need to be trusted, which leads you to trusted hardware, and trusted hardware fundamentally requires um, obfuscation, which makes it hard to decentralize. We'll get into that later. Now, what biometrics are there? I mentioned a couple of areas, fingerprints, face, DNA, iris, you name it. Fingerprints have the problem that they're only unique up to so many people. You can have like maybe a million different fingerprints before they all start to look alike. Um, faces, kind of the same problem. Um, face ID starts not being able to distinguish people anymore in like, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 people. Um, the reason this is good enough for authentication is because if I unlock my phone, my phone knows who it's looking for and it sees that I match the stored record and it's fine. And if 10 other people try it that are still well within the limits, they will all be rejected and my phone will go into a lockup. So for authentication purposes, it is fine. Our problem is much harder. We need to distinguish between all humans. Matching everyone against everyone, a quadratically harder problem. Fortunately, irises are actually good enough to solve this. But, um, like I said, that requires sophisticated hardware. There's been years of development, which led to the ORP, which is an amazing device. We have one here, we have a transparent one here. Feel free to uh, meet us later in the evening and we can even take one apart if you want and explain everything. Now, the iris code, um, I just want to explain quickly how it, how it works, just to demystify the, uh, the thing itself, but basically there's a high resolution picture that is being taken from both eyes actually, not just the one. Um, it is being segmented and then it goes through a so-called gobble wavelet filter. You can see the filter kernels below there, which results in this bitmap image you see on the right. And then the way we check if it's a unique new human being is that we compare this against all the previous ones we've seen, and we simply take the Hamming distance, like the number of bits that are different uh, as a fraction of the total number of bits. And if you, see, if you do that um, with the algorithms we've trained, you end up with a graph that looks like the one on the right, where um, in, in our test set, where we have like, the same subject producing many, many um, iris images, you get this blue distribution, they're all within a distance of 0 0.3 from each other, and then all the people who are not the same person, all the different iris scans, are in a cluster that is in a larger distance away from uh, the measurement. So we can create a distance threshold, and if the Hamming distance is larger than this threshold, they're different people, otherwise they're the same people. That's it, that's how the iris code works. Then we build a whole system around that. The way it works is you install the app, the app creates a public-private key pair, it shows the public key as a QR code that gets scanned by the ORP. The ORP checks that you're a real live human being. It does the iris code thing I just explained. And then it signs using a um, key that is in the ORP itself. It signs a message containing your um, public key and the iris code and sends it to our backend server. In the backend server, we do this distance metric to make sure it's sufficiently distant from all the ones we've seen before. If that check passes, we add it to the database and we sign a transaction that adds your public key to a Merkle tree that lives on chain. This process is still pretty centralized, but from here on, um, things are a lot better because what happens now is you have a wallet and on this wallet is a private key, and you can use this to create a zero-knowledge proof. Um, and it's basically the same design for zero-knowledge anonymity that we've been seeing since the zero-coin paper. 
Uh, it's surprisingly robust, this design. Uh, it has four public inputs. It's the Merkle root of like a reasoned version of the Merkle tree that lives on chain. You have a context thing, which is like, hey, I want to claim this airdrop, or hey, I want to vote on this proposal. Um, it has a nullifier that I'll get into, and then it has a message which could be like, hey, I want the airdrop to be received on this address, or I want to vote for or against it. Then it has private inputs. Uh, one of them is the private key that you used during sign up, and the other one is a Merkle inclusion proof of your uh, public key in the, in, the, in the Merkle tree that lives on chain. Um, this zero knowledge proof basically proves three things. First of all, membership. Are you actually uh, part of this set of people that have been inserted into the system? Yes, you know the private key to the public key. Public key is in a Merkle tree, done. Uh, then there is a one-shot requirement, which is kind of a twist to get used to, but it basically means I haven't done this particular thing before, which is the only thing you need to learn about a human um, in the context of an airdrop or voting. You want to know that, is this a unique human, meaning has he, not, he or she not done this before? The way that is done is by generating a unique um, number for the human participating in this context. And that is done by simply hashing the private key with the context. This generates a nullifier, and this nullifier is part of the public input. It is essentially randomized, like unless you participate twice, you'll end up with random numbers. And this is checked outside of the zero knowledge proof. For example, in the smart contract, you just store a table of like, hey, these are all the nullifiers we've seen. If, we've, if we see a duplicate nullifier, we just reject this uh, proof. And then you have, of course, a message that is attached to it, like um, recipient address or the uh, vote that you, like the proposal that you want to vote for. Okay, so that's the system so far. Um, it's pretty amazing at privacy due to simply not needing much information in the first place. At no point was your name required, for example, to sign up. And the extra layer of serial knowledge proves that each time you use it, um, you don't actually even reveal the public key. Um, I kind of skipped over that part, but your public key is part of the private input. It's not in the public input. So when you create one of these proofs, the only thing that is revealed is that you're part of the uh, part of the set, not which member of the set you are. So every action is anonymous, and every action, like if you do multiple actions, like you claim an airdrop, you vote on one proposal, you vote on another proposal, you wouldn't even be able to tell that it was the same user doing these actions. So the anonymity is um, pretty amazing, the privacy is pretty amazing, but what about all the other cypherpunk values that we care about? What about decentralization, for example? Um, and this is where we get into the territory of like kind of future developments, my own personal speculation. None of this is canonical. Um, first, an interesting one is this trusted hardware that we have. That sounds very centralized, and yes, um, it, it is to an extent at the moment. Um, we have open source the hardware, uh, but hardware being hardware, it is made of many non-open components. Like we use off-the-shelf ICs, and those are not open source. Like, the state of open source in hardware is a very different story from software. The other is that it relies on certain things like tamper protection, just making sure that no one is like installing bugs in the ORP that would hurt our users. Um, and things like that just fundamentally depend on security through obscurity. Uh, like physics simply doesn't implement digital signature algorithms and other things that you could use. Like you, you, you don't have these nice cryptographic properties in the physical domain that we love so much in the mathematical domain. So you need to rely on crude, uh, cruder mechanisms to get your security. Um, we, of course, want to do better than our status quo, and ideally we'd have third-party people um, building orbs. Um, challenges here are making sure the quality is high enough. Like, a critical part is the liveness check, making sure that it's actually looking at a human being. Um, so how do we make sure that a third-party provider of the orb, like verifying that they implement the iris code correctly, seems doable, but verifying that they have sufficient liveness checks in there is a whole other story. Another one is like, how do we actually uh, make sure that these orbs 
are not intentionally malicious. Like they could even be designed to pass some certification process and then become malicious in the field. Um, kind of an open question that we're working on, on uh, how can we set this up in a way that we can have third-party vendors, whoever wants, build, uh, build orbs in a way that um, is simultaneously decentralized, but also doesn't harm the integrity of the system. Uh, another fun challenge is uh, iris code reversibility. I, I showed the iris code before, and like it kind of resembles something. And the question is, like, how much does it resemble the original eye? There has been some papers published on uh, very similar iris codes, and to what extent you can get original images back. Um, it's an interesting research co uh, problem, like to what extent you can actually do that. Uh, and one thing that would personally worry me is if you can do it to an extent that you can actually get then get irises, iris images back that you could feed into a third party system. Because then let's say they would also work if you feed them again uh, through clear system, now you can link those databases together, which is undesirable. Um, so yeah, the status quo is we have an iris code that is not perfectly hiding of the original image. It's definitely information loss, but not perfect yet. What we want is a cryptographic one-way function. Um, challenge here is like, how do we do that, but still be able to compute this uh, fuzzy distance threshold? Um, note, we don't actually need to have the distance itself. We just need to know that it's sufficiently distant. There are a variety of techniques here in cryptography literature that have been studied. Um, yeah, continuing that research and trying to apply it and making it work in our context is an interesting challenge. The uniqueness service. So we have this central database that contains the iris codes that we need to do these distance metrics on. Um, it's a central database at the moment. We want this decentralized. Now, originally, uh, or like, one of the things we considered some time ago was like, hey, maybe we can just post these iris codes on chain. And then we can do a very simple optimistic proof that if you, um, if you see two iris codes that got added uh, that are not, enough, uh, not sufficiently distant, we can literally just compute the Hamming distance in a contract and pay out a bounty for the, for the finder. So it can easily be decentralized. The problem is that then you leak the iris codes and as long as we don't have the iris code irreversibility, that just seems a step too far. And in this case, we make the trade-off that we would rather have stronger privacy than stronger decentralization. It's one of those compromises. Merkle proof, uh, private information retrieval. Merkle trees are big. Um, mobile phones, wallets cannot download the entire Merkle tree to get their Merkle inclusion proof. So instead, they rely on a, a third-party server to do that. Right now, we host that server, but this also means that we can see all the users requesting the particular leaf that contains their public key. So we learn which public keys at the moment are trying to produce a proof, which is not desirable. We would rather have private information retrieval. We looked it into various PIR um, techniques. They currently just seem out of realm in terms of performance for the scale that we need. Um, further work here would help us. Um, alternatives are make it easier for users to self-host their own indexing server. Although the question is how many of the users will actually do this. Or just um, accept the fact that we will learn the public key that is looking, but at least put a layer of IP obfuscation in between so we cannot associate it with their IP addresses anymore. Uh, another, um, another more deep uh, question that I think is very relevant for many projects that want to use anonymity is recovery and nullifiers. So right now the status quo is that if you reset your key, if you generate a new public-private key pair, let's say we, um, we do remove your old public key, we insert your new public key in a Merkle tree, the problem is that the way nullifiers are derived, you will now produce completely new nullifiers for all the um, instances where you used this before. And this is, um, this is a problem if nullifiers need to be live for a long period of time. For things like a weekly airdrop or voting on shortlist proposals, this is not a huge issue. But if you want to have, let's say, a verified human flag on a Twitter account, 
this becomes a problem because now you need this proof to be um, valid for a very long time. We ideally want some form of account abstraction here to maintain the nullifiers. Uh, the challenge here is that if we don't have a private key anymore, what do we use as the entropy source to generate nullifiers? Um, image self-custody. Uh, right now, if we want to update the iris code, users need to go back to an orb in order to sign up again. Or during sign up, they say that well, we also want to send you the raw, uh, we also want to send the raw images to the server so that the server can help you um, recompute the iris code when we have a new version of that. We don't want that. Uh, we don't want this data. So one of the ideas is we can turn the ORP into an authenticating sensor. It just signs your image and send it, sends it to you. And then you, on your phone, now have an image that we know um, is like this high resolution raw image of your iris. And you can compute your iris code yourself, but um, there's no trusted hardware on your phone. So we need to wait to make sure that you do this correctly. But we can do this using zero knowledge proofs. And this is what got us interested in the field of um, zero knowledge machine learning. Like how do we do these machine learning algorithms on a mobile device so we can just turn the org into a essentially a fancy liveness checking authenticating camera, but do all the iris code specific stuff on your mobile device. Uh, Reauthentication. Another thing we have like currently you on, on sign up and recovery, you create a public private key pair, and at that point, that's the point where we make sure that you are the person who is signing up. But, uh, like I said, you can automate the account, it's just a private key after sign up. So there is no guarantee that the same user is actually still in control of this private key. And we do want this guarantee um, to be checked occasionally or for high value transactions or you name it. So you want some way of making sure that it is still the same user using the private key. Uh, some ideas here are if we already turn the ORP into an authenticating camera, we can also give it, uh, let it take an authenticated face image of the person signing up. And now you can use the phone's own camera to do a face ID match. Uh, and we can uh, again use some form of zero knowledge machine learning to match this against the original phase that signed up. The problem here is that this requires trusted hardware on the phone because now we need to somehow verify that the, in, that the input image was actually an image real life from the person using the phone and not some random injected data by a piece of malware. Um, and we need some form of liveness check still, which right now, I mean, you can do it using a phone camera. This is actually how a lot of KYC processes are done. You just video call with some service and then make sure that you're a moving face. Um, but verifying that in a full self-custody uh, on mobile device seems even out of realm for what we can feasibly do with zero knowledge machine learning, but maybe things will advance sufficiently. Now, and then finally, the m most ambitious thing you could do is like full self-custody identity. If you take all the things that, um, all the ideas we had so far, and we have a known face, um, you have a known, like, authenticated face of yourself in your wallet, um, you can scan your digital passport, you can even ZKML face match that face with the passport, and now we have a whole link all the way from your original sign up to um, the contents of your passport, and you can start doing arbitrary computable predicates over this data. So you could prove that you're of legal age to participate in something, like you're old enough to participate in this global pension scheme, um, you're not on some sort of OFAC blacklist or whatever, uh, and you can do all that while revealing nothing about yourself other than that you match the criteria. Um, you could even use stuff like TLS Notary to pull in, let's say, public records of academic degrees and see that the name matches your name and prove that you hold a certain degree without revealing when or where you studied. Um, this is the deep future and it depends critically on getting much, much better mobile provers. So a big research topic for us is improve the mobile provers. Now, that's kind of the ideas I've been playing around with. Um, let's see where kind of at time, so I'm gonna skip these lessons learned. I've kind of covered them during the thing itself. But it's, one of the lessons I wanna give you is that this is very much a trade-off space. Like, 
If you want to increase decentralization, it usually means, or, or increase transparency that can come at the cost of privacy, and you need to make trade-offs here and figure out what are the best solutions that work for both the long-term success of the project as a whole, but also the immediate needs of the users you have. And everything matters at scale. That's the other thing um, that I learned very much. Um, at WorldCoin size, literally everything that can happen will happen. Everything that can be thrown at you will be thrown at you. Um, so you need to, you don't have this level of forgiveness that tiny startups have. Things need to be right and done right. So just for the record, the time of the presentation was slightly extended because that's the last talk here on this stage. Just to get a temperature check, how many people will want to ask a question? Can you raise your hands? Okay, we, we have like a couple, couple more minutes, <laughs> but it's definitely more that we can, uh, we can figure. So I'll just ask you to come to the front and think of your question and look into the orb. <laughs> uh, I think it was the first person over there. I will pass over the mic. We'll give it four minutes. Thank you again for the talk. Uh, I have actually two questions. So first question, have you considered out of curiosity teeth to be also well able to identify dead people? And second question, do you have customers? Um, yeah, I would say, so the first question was about how to identify dead people. This is where re-authentication come in. Like one of the things you can do once you have this mobile face re-authentication is say that like start requiring it after a month of like not not having done that. So like if you if you if you haven't used your um, face re-authentication for more than a month, you can like ask the user like, hey, you need to. It's kind of like with password managers that expect you to re-enter your password every two weeks. It just checks freshness and liveness. Thank you. Next question. Um, I believe that you rely a lot on enclaves um, because the orb is enclaves and we, we scan our iris and everything happens inside the enclave. I wonder whether uh, do you have any defense in depth for the supply chain attacks that could happen with the enclave because I don't think, because it's publicly accessible, right? We have uh, someone here from our team that is much more qualified to answer this question. Oh, <laughs> Hi everyone, that's a good question. Just to repeat it if, to make sure I understood, it's about supply chain attacks on the hardware compromising the security properties of the device, is that right? Yeah. Um, so it's impossible to fully mitigate that. I mean, if a, if a government coordinated with uh, a primary supplier, that's true of like basically every hardware project. Um, what we can do is make sure that between a trusted vendor and us, things haven't been tempered and there's various ways of doing that. We can talk about that afterwards. Uh, uh, can we, there, there were more people. So I, I, I want to add to this that we're also doing a lot of our own research on like how secure the hardware is. And I'm quite proud of the fact that I think last year we were the largest external contributor to finding security flaws in NVIDIA Jetson. <laughs> so next question. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious, so from Filecoin, um, and we have this thing called data cap, which kind of enables people to store files usually for free in the Filecoin network. It's an incentive system for people to onboard useful data into the 10 exabytes of capacity. Can I airdrop data cap to WorldCoin IDs somehow so that every human identified by their individual biometrics can get yes, say, how absolutely. Um, this is actually one of my favorite use cases. Like right now, if you go to a physical market, people hand out free samples on the time all the time. Online, we don't have this. Instead, we have advertisement. I don't like advertisement. I want to replace it with free samples. We don't have free samples because people would abuse the hell out of it because we don't have a way to limit it per person. But now we do. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Um, I know you're a technical person, but I was wondering on your thoughts on the relationship between WorldCoin and OpenAI. Sam Oldman is the CEO of both. 
and yeah, how do you respond to the uh, sort of like labor concerns and labor exploitation that has been happening in the global south? And yeah, like the critiques about colonialism and imperialism and yeah. Uh, that's a bunch of things, not really a question in there, but let me address it. Uh, Sam Altman is the CEO of OpenAI as far as I remember, but he's just a founder of WorldCoin. He is involved, uh, but Alex Blania is the CEO of WorldCoin. Um, Global South is interesting. Some people tell us we're neglecting them and we should spend more time making sure that we support everything there. Other people say that we spend too much time there and we should focus on the Western world. You tell me. Thank you. So one last question. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, could you elaborate a bit more on the plans of decentralizing the hardware production and getting third party uh, people to manufacture without running into too many issues with the secure element and like managing which orbs are actually allowed to write into the database? Um, I mean, some form of a whitelisting process will have to be developed, I imagine. Um, hardware is an involved process. It's not like a random hacker is going to uh, build like a fully fledged orb, especially not at scale. That requires supply chains and a whole organization to set up. But if you're interested, um, we can definitely talk and like get you, get you set up as the second manufacturer of orbs. So one last tiny question, and then we'll finish. Final question. Um, to the other gent's question on the Global South, I was in Kenya a lot last year, and uh, you had agents in various shopping malls um, getting people to scan their orbs, and it was very much a chest-bumping, hey, bro, hype sort of uh, What's supposed to be, sorry, what's supposed yeah. to be a so quick the, 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 point, the point I'm making, I had a look at your website, and at the time, it, it, your, your white paper was extremely scant, and so there'd be no promises to those people as to how their data would be used and protected. So I was wondering if, uh, if, if, their, if their irises were used in any other sort of uh, training or application uh, prior to, you know, the, the, the full white paper having been launched with the, with the protections that you're describing now. Uh, good questions. I think that's too specific for me to address directly, uh, but generally um, we have like explicit consent forms that explain exactly what happens with the data. We've been doing this pretty much from day one when we uh, had our first like non-team member signups and so on. So. With that, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we should be fair towards other speakers as well and shouldn't extend it too much. Uh, so again, thank you, Remco. Thank you.